you are a professor at McMaster's University and the author of The One Minute Workout. So it's great to have you on our channel today and thank you so much for joining us. Thanks for the opportunity. So Dr. Kabbalah, I think everyone kind of, well, many people understand that exercise is something that we, we should do. It has many benefits. Uh, and But the, the thing is, what is the best way to do it? And also what is the most effective, efficient, because time tends to be a, a limiting factor, uh, or at least people believe it is. And so you've been studying interval training as a way of kind of, uh, I guess, being more efficient at our training. So could you talk to what do you consider to be interval training? Could, could you kind of introduce what would fit within that envelope? Sure. Uh, so interval training to me is just intermittent periods of relatively hard effort interspersed with periods of recovery. So that's a very simple definition. You'll notice I didn't use the word high or vigorous in there at all. And so interval exercise is just this idea of hills and valleys, going a little bit harder, backing off, taking a break and, and repeating that. Now, that's a very unsatisfying definition for most people. I think when mean, many people think about interval training, they think about high level athletes and any serious endurance athlete incorporates high intensity interval training into their training because it's a well-established technique to optimize endurance performance. And they might get very sophisticated in terms of how they define interval training, various zones, linking that to heart rate or blood lactate levels. For mm. the individual who's just interested in general health, We've been studying vigorous intermittent exercise, and we've increasingly started to use that term vigorous because it's well-defined in exercise guidelines, uh, public health uh, guidelines. And so again, it's typically anchored relative to heart rate, perceived effort. And so for example, a, a perceived effort level of uh, seven out of 10 or 14 or so on a 20 point scale, those would be uh, the, the cutoff level or the minimum threshold to get into this idea of higher intensity interval exercise or vigorous intermittent exercise as a way to enhance health. You use the word efficiently. Uh, you know, I, I, I prefer or like that term because I think if interval training offers really anything, it's the potential for efficiency. So you can get to your goal maybe a little bit faster or you can get there with less uh, time commitment or less total exercise uh, amount. Uh, and you can get to a similar place as more traditional moderate intensity continuous exercise. Okay, yes. And I'd like to dive into a lot of those pieces in more detail. So one thing is, so I'm looking at HIT. Oh, I guess, yeah, various forms of HIT. And I see uh, like there's Tabata, where it's like 10, uh, 20 on, 10 off. Or there's sprint intervals, which is 20 on one minute off. Or there's something like four by four, which is like four minutes off, four minutes on. And to me, they seem very different when you're doing them. Do they all have the same effect? Do they have different effects? And how would you choose between them? Sure. So a couple thoughts there. Uh, you're right. You know, so number one, we use this catch-all term interval training. Then to us, high intensity is getting into this vigorous intensity range as we just uh, talked about and defined. Uh, if you're an athlete, you might talk about getting into the severe intensity range and athletes will use things like uh, maximal lactate steady state or critical power. But let's just focus on the health side for now. So getting into this vigorous intensity range. And uh, again, uh, to, to me and many of my colleagues, you can break up high intensity interval train into uh, hit and a more intense variant that's typically referred to as sprint interval training. And again, in a recent uh, review that's about to be published, we've tried to delineate this a little bit more. And so if we look at the exercise guidelines, for example, from the American College of Sports Medicine, they have a category within the vigorous range termed near maximal to maximal. And so that it's, it's just that. So you're working very, very hard close to your all out sprint pace or at what we'll sometimes call your sprint from danger pace. So you can imagine the pace that you would uh, run or cycle at to save your child from an oncoming car or save a loved one or escape a burning building. So this is very, very uh, uncomfortable type exercise and typically you engage in it for short duration. 
So really the, the distinction there between high intensity and sprint comes back to uh, intensity and the specific metrics you use to define it. I don't think we have a really good answer to the question of which of those are, are best. And so we use these, or many people are interested in optimal, best. And mm -hmm. I think, you know, the unsatisfying answer is we don't know which of one, which of those are best. Uh, and probably for most people, it doesn't really matter. And so if you're interested in interval exercise, what we typically encourage is try different types of interval training. Uh, ideally, identify one that you might like or prefer because fundamentally, or back to the basics, you know, uh, writ large, the, the biggest issue is that most people are insufficiently active. And so uh, number one, it's just find something you like and enjoy. And if that's traditional moderate intensity exercise, that's that's perfectly fine. There's, there's nothing uh, wrong with that. Um, you know, I'm sure we're going to get into VO2 max, cardiorespiratory mm -hmm. fitness. I think there there is some good data, number one, to suggest that for a given dose of exercise, higher intensity or more vigorous efforts will potentiate the gains. Uh, and also um, longer intervals. So here we're talking three, four, five minute duration intervals. That's sort of the highest sustainable effort that you could maintain uh, repeated a number of times, that's probably the best way to potentiate uh, gains in uh, in VO2 max or cardiorespiratory fitness. Okay, four by fours, that sounds like to me. So would you put uh, Tabata in like the 100%, the, 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 the very high, or would you put it in the medium? No, um, absolutely, the Tabata. So uh, again, a couple, couple so classic Tabata, mm -hmm. <laughs> as originally described, was at a pace of, 170% of right. VO2 max. So it's it's definitely sprint type, uh, right. near all out effort or all out effort. I think over time, Tabata has morphed into many different things. And you, you, know, you can go to the gym and take a Tabata class and it might not necessarily uh, entail the classic Tabata, which was basically 20 seconds, very, very, very hard, 10 seconds off, repeated, uh, eight times. And that was actually on a bike as well. You know, Tabatas now have morphed into body weight style training. So uh, there's strict definitions. And then there's the way that it's often uh, used in, 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 in popular uh, fitness classes nowadays. Yeah. The only thing about Tabata is like the 10 seconds is just not enough to recover. So I am totally not recovered at all when I start my next 20. Um, and so it, it just seems I don't know, different from something like the others where you, you do have time to recover, at least. A, no, a I, absolutely. Yeah, I, no, I, absolutely. You're right. And and this is what, you know, uh, Tabata is an extremely uncomfortable way of exercising. <laughs> you know, it might be very effective, especially if you're a high level athlete, but it's not necessarily mm -hmm. for, uh, for everyone. What I will say is I think for a, a, a lot of types of interval training, we can think of this uh, you know, curvilinear exponential rise where you can get a lot of bang for your buck with a couple of intervals. And then the more you do, you're getting increasing gains, but it starts to flatten out. My, my colleague, Dr. Stuart Phillips, when he talks about resistance training sets, he talks about wringing out the sponge. So you can imagine mm -hmm. if you have a, a sponge soaked with water, you wring it once or you squeeze it, you get a fair bit of water out. And then the more you squeeze it, the more efforts, you're going to get increasing drips of, of water out. Uh, and so there's an analogy there in terms of you're still going to get gains, but a lot of the value or a lot of the benefit can come with only a few short, uh, hard efforts. Now, if you're an elite athlete, you want to maximize the gains as much as possible. But if you're just an average individual looking to boost your fitness, it's not necessarily for you to go to these extremes uh, all the time or training as hard as you can, as long as you can uh, all the time. Right. And so do you think there's ever a point where it starts to go down, where, where you can do in one session? Uh, you know, it, can you do too much exercise? Absolutely. Mm -hmm. You know, can, yeah. can, uh, can you do too many intervals? Absolutely. Right. And, you know, mm -hmm. uh, athletes, uh, are mindful of overtraining all the time. So clearly a very high volume of very intense exercise can uh, diminish gains and, and actually reverse some of the gains. So absolutely. And I think, you know, applying that to in individuals interested in health uh, the same way they can do too much as well. You can do too much. Okay. Just one interesting point. When I'm doing four by four, the third run, 
is actually the best. D- does that sound correct? I mean, is that what you would expect? I, I think, you know, if there's one thing I've learned about interval training and exercise generally, we could give a hundred people the exact same program. Some would thrive, some, some would wither, some would really enjoy it, some would absolutely detest it. And so I think this is highly uh, individualized. You know, I've heard a lot of people say it's that last one that I really enjoy the most because I know it's done uh, at, at the end of that. So well, I think it's highly individualized. Okay. Stress is a part of life, but it doesn't have to control you. One way to manage stress is to make sure you're getting enough magnesium. Magnesium is a mineral that plays a role in over 300 biochemical reactions in the body. When you're stressed, your body uses up magnesium more quickly. So how do you break the vicious stress magnesium deficiency cycle? I've been taking magnesium breakthrough from bio-optimizers, and it's made a big difference for me. It helps me stay calm and focused during the day and to sleep better at night. Magnesium Breakthrough contains all seven forms of magnesium, which are essential for optimal absorption and utilization. If you're feeling overwhelmed and stressed, give Magnesium Breakthrough a try. It's a simple and effective way to improve your overall well-being, and it's risk-free because Bioptimizers offers a 365-day money-back guarantee. Just go to magnesiumbreakthrough.com modern and enter the code MODERN10 for 10% of your order. And for a limited time only, you'll receive a special gift with each purchase. This offer is only available on magnesiumbreakthrough.com slash modern. So be sure to check it out today. Thank you for your support. If we're going to pick one of these, we're going to do them. Uh, Like what would be our total goal for a particular session? Like, so how many minutes would we want to be? I guess how many total minutes or how many exercise minutes, uh, whichever would be the correct metric. Yeah. And, you know, so if we look at the current public health guidelines generally Mm. uh, worldwide are 150 minutes of moderate to vigorous intensity exercise, you know, depending on the country or region, there's some variation uh, on that. But, you know, that's about two and a half hours of exercise that the government or agencies would be recommending Mm. that we uh, that we engage in. Um, In in terms of interval training, a, a question that often comes up is, you know, do you count the recovery uh, intervals. Mm. Uh, and I, I think the general answer is uh, yes. And, you know, uh, when I when I uh, when I wrote my book, I I, uh, I interviewed uh, I'm in Lee, who's a professor at uh, Harvard University, who literally is involved in writing the public health guidelines. And I put that question uh, out. And that was the answer that, yeah, you could uh, count the recovery intervals. So you could imagine if you're, you know, here in Canada, uh, ice hockey is a popular sport, right? And the mm-hmm. classic way that you engage in ice hockey is maybe one shift uh, every third shift, right? So two other people jump over the vents and get on. So <laughs> in a one hour hockey game, you might have 20 minutes of very intense effort on the ice, but you mm-hmm. can count that as an hour of physical activity. So those recovery periods uh, can uh, can count. So many team sports or, uh, you know, uh, other ways of engaging an activity in a group setting, you sort of count the entire uh, period. You know, if you're playing uh, a tennis match or pickleball, uh, you know, you're not always exercising the whole time, but you'd count the entire duration uh, as, as physical activity. In terms of the, again, the ideal or the best length of session, uh, I don't think we have an answer. Um, our original work we were often having 20 to 30 minute exercise sessions. And often people were doing this three times a week. Those were our classic studies, you know, and it was pointed out at the time that, well, it's not that time efficient then if you're doing, you know, 90 minutes a week or so of, of activity. Mm -hmm. And so over time, we've deliberately tried to shrink the time commitment. You know, the, the, the title of my book is the one minute workout, but that's based on a protocol where we're using three 20 second hard efforts within a total time commitment of 10 minutes. Mm -hmm. So if people are doing that three times a week, it's only 30 minutes a week of time commitment. And within that 30 minute block, it's only three minutes a week of very vigorous exercise. So again, by um, purposefully, we're trying to constrain the total amount of exercise because we're interested in that question of, you know, how, how low can you go or can you get away with this little exercise and still see uh, benefits? That's not to suggest that that's the optimal way to train. And, you know, now that's led us to um, 
a series of studies that are, are ongoing right now looking at the notion of exercise snacking, which is just one minute periods of vigorous effort spread throughout the day. So you can imagine as we're having our uh, interview right now, we could get up from our desks, do a series of air squats for a minute uh, mm -hmm. or burpees for a minute. And if you spread those throughout the day, is that sufficient to sort of move the needle on markers of fitness or blood markers of, uh, of health? So it's really, I think, on a, on a spectrum in terms of the time commitment. Right. And that's ongoing. Do, do you have results from that yet? Well, we do know that from our small lab-based proof of concept studies that, for example, six weeks of this exercise snacking type approach uh, can measurably improve cardiorespiratory fitness, and it can elicit some changes in blood health markers related to blood fats or uh, insulin sensitivity. Uh, again, these are small-scale initial studies to start, and what we have right now are some ongoing multi-site randomized um, trials. Uh, trying to uh, look at this in more detail in larger numbers of, of individuals. Can you apply the same kind of principles for resistance training? Uh, 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 yes. <laughs> uh, and, and so you, you can certainly, um, you can engage in interval style exercise with resistance exercise mode. And, and the classic example there would be bodyweight style training, mm -hmm. right? And so, you know, that is resistance exercise. And if you keep the recovery periods relatively short, heart rate stays up. And so that appears to provide a dual benefit, if you will. You have an aerobic conditioning benefit uh, because heart rate stays elevated and you also get some muscle strengthening benefit. Now, the strengthening is not going to be as great as traditional heavy weightlifting exercise, and the aerobic benefit isn't going to be as uh, great as you know traditional aerobic style endurance training. Uh, but you can definitely uh, apply this in a resistance style mode and see some benefits. Right. So you could do like burpees at home or whatever. Absolutely. I call. I used to call them hotel room workouts. Right. So yeah. you know you can't get to the gym, so mm -hmm. you. You imp improvise and it can be a very, um, uh, you know, effective or efficacious way of training when uh, when you're limited for time and limited for space and equipment. Uh, but can you build muscle with HIT? So, so I guess more generally, how does it impact your overall body composition? Yeah. So, you know, the, I, I use this analogy a lot or it's on, you know, this this phrasing a lot. And when I talk to my students, we say, you know, we mainly control body weight, body composition through the nutrition side of things. Mm -hmm. We control fitness through exercise and, and physical activity. And so big picture in terms of uh, body composition, interval training, like many forms of exercise, uh, can be used to support uh, body weight efforts, body composition efforts, but it's not the primary driver. And so, you know, people think they can just engage in a few short bouts of high intensity interval exercise and the pounds will melt away. It's just not, uh, that's, that's just not true. Um, so that's, that, that would be point number one. Point number two, in terms of building muscle. So traditional interval exercise, uh, as we might perform on a bike or a treadmill or an elliptical machine, the, the hypertrophy or the muscle gains from that are, are very small, uh, if any. It probably depends on your starting point. So if you're, uh, you know, a, a younger to middle-aged individual who's already involved, engaged in some type of exercise, there's, there's probably no benefit at all in terms of uh, muscle um, size gains. If you're, you know, an older individual who's otherwise not doing much at all, the, the stimulus that you might need to get some hypertrophy is very, very small. But Generally speaking, traditional intervals, aerobic style intervals on a bike or that don't lead to uh, hypertrophy gains. Mm -hmm. But if we engage in resistance style interval training, body weight style interval training, then you could see some gains mm -hmm. in, uh, in, in muscle size and, uh, and muscle strength. So would anything change with age as you get to like 60, 70 and so on? Uh, yeah, it, would, it, would you have kind of different advice or different thoughts? So uh, number one, you know, can older individuals, and again, we're getting into 60, 70, even octogenarians can, uh, there, there's studies to show that they can perform interval type exercise, vigorous exercise and benefit from that style of training. Mm -hmm. 
At the same time, I think we need to be, you know, uh, the exercise often might need to be modified for a couple of reasons. One, clearly, a- as we age, the risk of cardiovascular mm-hmm. events tends to rise, right? And so mm-hmm. people don't need to be afraid of interval training as, you know, it's a heart attack waiting to happen or anything like that. But I think they need to be just need to be smart about it, right? And so ideally, of course, our common advice is to get uh, assessed by your physician. Um, But, you know, if the choice is between remaining completely sedentary and on the couch or engaging in vigorous exercise, the greater risk to your health is is going to be remaining uh, sedentary. Um, You know, the, the specific intensity that you might choose to engage in, you know, maybe you do more hit style training and you're not doing these all out uh, sprints. The style of training matters as well. And so, um, especially for individuals who might have aging joints or knee issues or things like that, engaging in vigorous exercise on an elliptical machine or on a bike is quite different from pounding on a treadmill or running down a track. So, again, like a lot of things, context matters here. And we can't just sort of say intensity, good or bad. It's what specific intensity and how are we applying that stimulus? Because it, it, it really matters in terms of relative risk, both in terms of cardiovascular and especially musculoskeletal risk as well. 